scripture verse in the 119th Psalm, verse 160, it says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So there you have the inspiration. And by the way, spira means breath. So anything that is inspired was God breathed or he, he breathed his brains came up about inspiration. But the question is, how much of the breath of God is there in that book? And I believe that the breath of God very well permeates this book. Therefore, if you want to say in English it's inspired, and the Latin would say in breathed, and uh, the Greek would say that it is blown along or carried along as with a wind, you see, and uh, remember Jesus' uh, conversation with Nicodemus, the wind bloweth where it listeth. In other words, it blows where it wants to. And God blows where he wants to. And thou hearest the sound thereof, and you can't tell where it's coming from, and you can't tell where it's going. But if he blows it, he knows. And you know, uh, it's very interesting what God can do. Uh, it's even possible for God to save a sinner to be sitting in a place where uh, a modernist is talking about bunk. And God can still save him if, if he's of a mind to him. The Holy Spirit's there. I was, as a student, I was sent to, a, uh, to look at other churches other than ours, and one of the places I was sent to go was a modernistic, very liberal. And the preacher there was, uh, he was a modernist. And he spent the whole time uh, on the subject of there is a God. <clears throat> but nearly everything he said, uh, it seemed to me, he showed that uh, as far as he was concerned, there was no God, but his subject was, there is a God. That's tremendous, isn't it? And uh, on the way out, there weren't a lot of people in the church. It would have, it would have holded a hundred, hundred more, a hundred times as many as were in it. But uh, I happened to be right behind a dear little old lady, a habitual church goer, uh, who was there, and I was right behind her to, I wanted to get out without shaking hands with the pastor, but I, it was what, not my luck. He was there by the door, and it was, I didn't see any other. And she was right ahead of me, and she shook hands with him, and she looked up into his face, and she said, Pastor, I have to tell you that no matter what you say, I still believe in God. <laughs> And so I did escape because he hadn't overcome that when I got by. <laughs> I didn't have to say anything to him. But that's just about the tenor of the whole thing. You see, but God, it was the breath of God that's breathed into the book. And the portion of the breath of God that's in the book, it's just going to come out and it's going to convict sinners and it's going to do his work and, and, and his will. And if we don't get in the way, it'll be in God's way. Now, you have a subject that's given to you on this program, and uh, I apologize. I'm not going to deal with that subject. It's very technical. Uh, I need about three hours instead of 35 minutes. I don't have 35 minutes anymore because of the way the program is moving. Uh, I couldn't any more. I couldn't do any more than to just stir up your, what should I say, dishonest doubts about that subject. So what I want to do is something that maybe I hope. I pray, more practical, more valuable to you. And if it isn't, why, uh, you get up and go to one of the other sessions and you won't offend me a bit because if there's nobody left here, why, well, I'll just stop talking. Uh, but uh, the first thing that I want to bring to your attention is the fact that in many, many American homes and even in the libraries of our churches, there are copies of the set called the Book of Life. You, ever, you know what the Book of Life is? You don't. The Book of Life, a, a bunch of uh, uh, encyclopedias that people are sold and uh, taught 
will be good to help to raise your children and all that sort of thing, the Book of Life? How many never heard of the Book of Life? Much hard to believe. Well, the rest of you, if you didn't hear of it, you did hear of it. If you did hear of it, you didn't buy it, well, you were smart. But in many of the churches and in many of the homes, there's the Book of Life. And I want to say that I have here a picture. I photocopied a few pages out of the Book of Life. Uh, and I, I wrote at the bottom of this that the Book of Life has contributed to the basic American attitude on both Scripture and Apocrypha. These pages tend to lift the perceptions of Jerome's abilities in Hebrew. Jerome was Catholic. Jerome is the, the father of the Vatican, the, the Vaticanus. Uh, the, no, that's not right. The, the, uh, the, what am I trying to say? The Vulgate. Thank you. I got the right first letter. Okay, the Vulgate. Yeah, Jerome's Vulgate. And, uh, both Roman and Orthodox Bibles are also lifted in this, and so is the Septuagint. And I want to bring to your attention that here are a bunch of pages. If I don't tell you what's there, maybe I should. When the church became wholly Gentile, it used the Septuagint exclusively with all its additions to the Hebrew text. See, now that's in your... That's in that... Uh, that book, that set of books. And uh, he, it says that it remained that way until the Reformation, and it is still. Now, the Protestants have usually held that the Apocrypha are religiously valuable. Is that true? Is that genuinely true? That's in the Book of Life, and a lot of our young people have been taught that. It says further, the 39 articles of the Church of England state that they are books which, quote, the Church doth read for example of life and instruction of manners, but yet doth it not apply them to establish any doctrine. And maybe that's all I have outlined, uh, underlined, but I bring to, and if you want to look at this, you may. If you want to borrow it and photocopy it, you may. But the Apocrypha is whitewashed by the Book of Life, and many homes have made the Apocrypha, which teaches prayers for the dead, and uh, uh, penance in purgatory, and of course the existence of purgatory, and that kind of thing that's unbiblical. And I have known Baptist pastors to support their ministries when the, a small church couldn't pay them, They'd go out and work for this company and sell this set of books to the various congregations of the county or all the counties around and make their living that way. And they should have read it instead and found out why they should not spread this kind of heresy. Uh, that's something that I thought ought to be said in a conference like this. And that's a very simple thing. And you don't need to know any of the Hebrew I put on the blackboard a while ago in order to understand that. Now, a lot of people, this is an entirely different subject. This is a bunch of flotsam. A lot of people have the notion that it was not until the late part of the 19th century that anybody began tampering with the Bible. That's not true. I have photocopied, what, two or three pages out of Eusebius's church history. Did you ever hear of Eusebius? Yeah, he was one of the church fathers. Now, the title of his book is The History of the Church from Christ to Constantine. Who knows what date it might have been that he wrote the book? Kind of early, isn't it? What century are you going to place it? Yeah, it's pretty early. Now, these manuscripts that they have recently, like the, the one that Tischendorf, you know, Aleph, and the Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus, these that all the new versions are playing up are dated as 4th century. See? Now, it's 
my idea and the idea of a number of them